Welcome, this is case two, Previvor, gene carrier identified via cascade testing, and I'm your moderator, Lauren Nye. I'm an assistant professor of internal medicine at the KU Cancer Center and breast medical oncologist, and I'm gonna introduce our fantastic expert panelists today. We have Dr. Deneo Cabelli, professor and chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Dr. Jamie Wagner, Associate Professor of Surgery and Division Chief of Breast Surgery at the KU Cancer Center. Dr. Annalisa Winblad, Breast Radiologist and Director of Breast Imaging at the KU Cancer Center. And Katie Nelson, Certified Genetic Counselor at the KU Cancer Center with a specialty in hereditary cancer. So we're gonna get started with our first case. And we have a 46-year-old premenopausal woman who presented to the high-risk breast clinic for a family history of breast cancer. She has no significant medical or surgical history. She had menarche at age 11, two children, and her first live birth was at age 28. Her family history is significant for a maternal aunt who had thyroid cancer, her father recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, a paternal aunt with breast cancer at age 42, this was a hormone-positive breast cancer, and paternal grandfather with prostate cancer at age 50. In the high-risk clinic, it's standard for us to estimate lifetime breast cancer risk to determine our recommendations. And we performed a tyrocusic risk assessment and estimated her lifetime risk of 19.1%. Based on this being just under the 20% threshold for high-risk screening, we recommended standard screening at this time with reassessment. And so that includes a clinical breast exam every 12 months, an annual breast tomosynthesis or 3D mammography, and recommended genetic counseling. Dr. Wimblad, do you mind reviewing the density on her mammogram? Sure. This patient has extremely dense breast tissue. And if we move on to the next slide, I have a nice pictorial display of the four categories of breast density. And you can see all the way on the left-hand side of the screen are patients with fatty breast tissue, and this is less than 25% fibroglandular volume. And all the way on the right-hand side are the patients with extremely dense breast tissue, such as the patient of ours you just saw on the prior slide. These patients have more than 75% fibroglandular volume, and both of the categories, heterogeneously dense and extremely dense, uh, qualify as dense breast tissue. It's really important to note that breast density is identified on imaging and not by physical breast exam. Now, nearly half of all women in the United States who are of screening age have dense breast tissue, so this is normal. This is nothing to be alarmed about, but there are two important reasons why breast density um, is a hot topic and really important to know about, and that's because, number one, uh, women with dense breast tissue have a higher likelihood of having cancer in their lifetime as compared to average risk women with um, fatty or scattered fibroglandular densities. And also women with dense breast tissue have, uh, they have cancers that are more difficult to find on mammography. And an extremely dense tissue, such as with our patient, sensitivity for finding breast cancer can be as low as 30%. And I have a case in point here um, this patient is a patient with fatty breast tissue, so very little fibroglandular volume in her breasts, and she has a right breast cancer. I've put circle around it. You probably don't even need the circle because it's so easy to identify. On the next slide, I have um, a different patient who has extremely dense breast tissue, similar to our uh, patient we're discussing today. And on her mammogram, we don't see anything abnormal. It looks like a normal mammogram, but I have a picture of her breast MRI a three-dimensional MIP image on the right, and you can see that her right breast is full of cancer, and this was not appreciated on her mammogram. Unfortunately, women with dense breast tissue tend to present with larger cancers. They tend to uh, more likely be lymph node positive and higher stage at presentation. We can move to the next slide, and you know the reason that um, we offer supplemental screening for women with dense breast tissue is because they have a higher risk of breast cancer, but also they're more likely to present with later stage disease. So I'm gonna discuss a little bit about uh, the supplemental screening test that we offer for patients with dense breast tissue. First and foremost, we offer 
uh, digital breast tomosynthesis, also known as 3D mammography, um, to all of our patients because it does benefit women of all breast density. Um, and this is because it helps us find more cancers and also helps the radiologist call patients back fewer times when their breasts are normal. The most common supplemental screening test is screening ultrasound. It's widely available and it tends to be the cheapest test. It typically finds an additional three or so cancers per thousand on top of mammography. And this can be either performed with a handheld probe or with an automated system. We know that breast MRI is our most sensitive test for binding breast cancer and breast MRI finds 10 or more additional cancers per thousand in women with dense breast tissue. Uh, most of the cancers that we find on supplemental screening tests, such as ultrasound and MRI, are small and no negative. And this is the argument for supplemental screening, uh, because we know that when we find small tumors that are no negative, that we can actually decrease morbidity and improve mortality for this patient population. Thank you. So this patient, when we first met her, hadn't had an initial screening mammogram, but now after getting this initial mammogram, we would go back and talk to her about supplemental screening. And so our patient does meet with a genetic counselor. She provides additional family history, including that her father recently had somatic testing completed for metastatic pancreatic cancer, which showed a BRCA2 variant. And so Dr. Er, now Katie Nelson is going to walk us through um, her genetic risk assessment. When doing a genetic risk assessment, it's really important to take a three-generation family history, uh, and that's really essential in being able to determine how much testing someone may need. So here we can see that this patient's father, as mentioned before, uh, has a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Uh, his sister had a diagnosis of breast cancer. There's no other individuals in that generation, as well as their father had a history of prostate prostate cancer may be suspicious that that could have been a metastatic prostate cancer given his young age of passing. And then also looking at the maternal side, we do see that thyroid cancer, uh, the patient was not able to determine what that pathology or specific type of thyroid cancer is. Uh, and so there's multiple indications here that show that we need to do panel testing. Uh, it was also noted that this patient has Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, uh, which as well tells us that we need to look at more genes given that there can be other genetic risks for the Ashkenazi Jewish population. It's really important when we know that family members as well have had previous genetic testing that we are able to see a copy of that report. Uh, so it's always important for us to, to get a copy of that family member's report, be able to look to see what mutations were on there. Um, as mentioned, this is a somatic report or a tumor report, which is primarily looking at uh, the actual cancer uh, or tumor genetics. And we expect to find a lot of mutations in a tumor. Uh, what is nice about this testing report is it does show a germline mutation. There are some somatic or tumor testings that can evaluate for germline testing. And we did see a mutation in her father's report that makes us suspicious that this patient as well could be having a BRCA2 mutation or BRCA1 mutation, I apologize. BRCA2, sorry, the picture is just a BRCA1. Oh, thank uh, you. This, that's the somatic first germline. So uh, when taking all of that into account and looking at the NCCN guidelines, we can see that this patient meets guidelines on multiple different levels. So just based on the family history of young breast cancer in her aunt, uh, as well as her father being diagnosed with the pancreas cancer and the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry as well as her father having the mutation found on the somatic testing. It is important to note that whenever there is a somatic report, we need to verify that finding with a clinical lab that has a lot of experience in doing germline testing because somatic labs do not have the same experience in uh, looking at germline tests as well as they have slightly different um, thresholds of when they either call something a mutation or what areas of the gene that they're looking at. Uh, there can be other things that could be found in these gene or in these genes. 
I would not just recommend doing BRCA2 for this individual, even though that was the only thing that looked suspicious with the somatic testing um, because these somatic labs are not looking at all of the breast cancer genes, are not looking at all of the pancreas cancer genes, it's still important to take a panel approach with this patient's testing. Great. So you would order full panel testing for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so Katie, she was found to have a germline pathogenic variant in BRCA2 with her testing. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to walk us through how do we discern the different um, results that we get in our genetic testing report? Yeah, so there are uh, five different results that we can technically get back from a lab. Um, really only uh, three or four of them are reported, so that being pathogenic, likely pathogenic, and variant of uncertain significance, or negative. Uh, the likely benign uh, is something that is trending or very confident that the lab is feeling that this is not increasing the risk for cancer. So likely benign results are no longer reported on genetic testing um, because it wouldn't change management. Variants of uncertain significance, we really don't have enough information to say one way or another. Is this concerning or is this normal human variation? So they are put on the reports, but they are not clinically actionable. Um, it has been reported that 90% of VUS results are eventually able to be reclassified as negative. So they're important to be aware of and to follow in case they are reclassified as a concern for the patient but we do not make medical management decisions based on these variants of uncertain significance, more so based on the family history. Likely pathogenic. So I'm sorry, I was going to say, so in a different scenario, if this was a VUS and BRCA2, you would not recommend pursuing any risk-reducing surgeries or anything mm -hmm. like that for this patient. Okay. Correct. We would still recommend that she have the increased screening based on the family history as well as her personal findings on that mammogram, um, but not based on a variant of uncertain significance would we recommend any um, uh, surgery management. And then I did just want to mention that likely pathogenic, when most of the labs classify something as likely pathogenic, they have to be over 95% confident that this is a concern for cancer. So we do treat likely pathogenic as pathogenic, but we do let patients know that there are some pieces of information that we may be missing or the lab may need to fully say that it is a pathogenic mutation. And those individuals we would treat as positive essentially, mm -hmm. if we're going to simplify it. Okay. All right, Dr. Cabelli, this falls into hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. What is that? So hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome is primarily associated with um, pathogenic mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. And uh, just as we see with this particular patient who has Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, um, uh, there's one in 40 uh, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, people from Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry have a disease causing or pathogenic BRCA gene mutation. This is in comparison to one in 300 to 500 individuals in the general population in the United States. So our patient has the BRCA2 pathogenic mutation, and this is associated with with several cancer risks. Most people know about the breast and ovarian cancer risk and the breast cancer risk can be estimated anywhere between 60 and 85%, depending on the literature that you're looking at, where the average woman's risk is closer to 12 to 13%. And the ovarian cancer risk can be estimated as high as 20, 25% in some literature, where the average woman's risk is much lower, just a few percent. Prostate cancer risk is elevated in men. And then we see an increased risk of pancreatic cancer, melanoma, and male breast cancer. When we're talking about what we do next about cancer screening and risk reduction, we really need to take an approach that involves shared decision-making. We need to be able to estimate the risk, provide the patient with information on screening, 
the risks and benefits of screening, and then listen to their values and preferences to determine the best screening and risk reduction methods for them. And so we're gonna start with Dr. Wimblad talking to us about what would be recommended for BRCA2 breast cancer screening. So women with genetics based risk should begin annual screening mammography at an earlier age, so around age 30, and should also begin a supplemental annual screening MRI at age 25. Interestingly for uh, BRCA2 genetic carriers, these women have a significant proportion of their cancers identified on mammography only. So mammograms are really important in this patient group. Um, of course, contrast enhanced breast MRI is our most sensitive exam. And this holds true for our high risk patients as well, where we find more than 15 cancers per thousand in this patient population. So screening MRI uh, is still very important to perform annually in these patients. And how do you time those? Do they do them at the same time? Do they spread them out? They can. There's no, um, some of our patients um, will have screening mammography and then six months later have an MRI and, um, but some of them will do it at the same time. Um, I think either or is a great option. And I think as long as you're doing them every year, um, that's the most important thing. And so when patients come to talk about breast cancer risk reduction in the high-risk clinic, and they have a BRCA mutation, specifically BRCA2 in this case, we talk about three categories of risk reduction, lifestyle, chemo prevention, and then risk-reducing surgery. For lifestyle, we extrapolate a lot of data from the high-risk breast population, which is mostly based on family history or benign pathology on breast biopsy. But we know that exercise, limiting alcohol, and having a healthy weight, specifically a healthy BMI, is associated with a lower risk of breast cancer. And there has been studies specifically done in BRC2. They're just much smaller, um, but they still show a benefit to living a healthy lifestyle and achieving these three specific goals. Chemo prevention is taking a pill to reduce your risk of breast cancer. And we have several options for chemo prevention, depending on if a woman's pre or postmenopausal. We have the SERMs or selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen or raloxifene. And then we have aromatase inhibitors. These are pills, they're anti-estrogen pills that a woman can take daily for five years. And in a high risk population, again, not specifically in a mutation carrier population, we know that they can decrease the risk of breast cancer by up to 50%. There is small amounts of data showing that BRCA2 carriers may likely still benefit from chemo prevention because they're very likely predisposed to the same types of breast cancers that we see in the general population, which are mostly hormone positive. Where in BRCA1 carriers, we do see a higher propensity for triple negative or hormone negative breast cancers. So we speculate that chemo prevention may be of less benefit to them. And then Dr. Wagner is going to talk to us more about risk-reducing surgery, which does have a clear risk reduction in BRCA2 carriers. So as Dr. Nye had just mentioned, it's very important for us to have a shared decision-making model, and that really starts with the foundation of education, because we know that um, having a mastectomy, oftentimes it, it's referred to as a prophylactic mastectomy, would say we now are starting to use more of the terminology of risk-reducing mastectomy. And with that, we are removing really the majority of the breast tissue. So from that, it provides a 90 to 95% risk reduction in developing a breast cancer. But part of that decision-making needs to be with what the patient's goals are and an understanding of the pros and cons of mastectomy compared to high-risk screening, as Dr. Winblad had just described. Because very interestingly, high-risk screening, which provides early detection at smaller um, cancer sizes and earlier stages, has no difference in survival for patients than undergoing a risk-reducing mastectomy. So your life is going to be the same um, and, and enjoy all those things. The difference is having to undergo uh, a mastectomy versus having to undergo cancer treatment. And unfortunately, we oftentimes don't get to pick the type of cancer that patients will have or um, some of the more extensive things that we need to do. And the big dis differentiator bit with treatment at that point of an early, even an early breast cancer that's been identified is the fact that 
We typically have no nodal procedure performed when we are doing mastectomy in a risk reducing setting before a cancer is identified compared to having to do at minimum a nodal assessment with a sentinel lymph node biopsy once we've had a breast cancer identified and we are performing a mastectomy in that setting. And along with sentinel lymph node biopsy, although the risk is low, only five to 10%, there is an associated risk of developing lymphedema within that woman's lifetime. From a mastectomy standpoint, those that want to do everything they can to at least identify that they have um, um, been educated and then those patients that want to pursue risk-reducing mastectomy, we have a lot of options. And that's the second component, I think, of the shared decision-making for this patient population. Because we have advanced um, significantly in the last two decades with mastectomy, from what you're seeing on the left is what people will say a traditional mastectomy, what we refer to as a total mastectomy. Um, some people will also call it a simple mastectomy. And that's where we're removing all the breast tissue and women are left flat when they're, when they're done. Um, so in that setting, we're removing the nipple and areola complex as well as skin ab above and below. So the elliptical um, incision lines that you're seeing drawn um, on this patient um, would be the incision lines. Um, so it still provides a complete closure of the skin. And then the box around it is what is describing what the true breast tissue is, because that's another I think, misconception of what breast tissue consists of, because it goes all the way up to your collarbone. Um, and that um, can have in and of itself a cosmetic change, even for patients who are just having a total mastectomy, because there can sometimes be a, a scalloping um, once, the, once the breast tissue has been removed. Um, we also are moving into an era of what women are, ca are calling an aesthetic um, total mastectomy. And that is because the dog ear is something that I think women dread the most when having a total mastectomy. Maybe they don't want to have reconstruction because it does include often more than one surgery. It could be as many as one additional surgery to the mastectomy, but I have seen women have several, five. Um, additional surgeries. And so the end goals for patients with their life and getting back to life and multiple surgeries needs to be part of that conversation, which we absolutely have. And in an aesthetic mastectomy, we're now trying to tailor the dog ears so that it lays nice flat, not just um, on the middle or the most medial aspect, but also under the um, armpit area, instead of having something that is extending out and can be bothersome, make it more challenging for a prosthesis to fit correctly. And that can either be done by the breast surgeon or often is coupled with a plastic reconstructive surgeon to do that more aesthetic closure. From there, we have had the most significant advances by um, understanding that we can preserve all of the skin envelope or the majority of the skin envelope um, uh, and that's what you're seeing in the middle with a skin sparing mastectomy. So the nipple areola complex is still removed and then the skin is really preserved. So I like to think of this and nipple sparing mastectomy of taking a pillow out of a pillowcase. So the breast tissue is the pillow and the skin is the pillowcase. So the breast surgeon is gonna take the pillow out of the pillowcase. And we want to optimize that first surgery by having a plastic surgeon there to begin filling the pillowcase. Um, not only are we able to overcome having that additional surgery just to start reconstruction, by saving that skin envelope, we're able to preserve more of the natural form of the breast, um, as well as the appearance of the breast. And that is because there's no other skin on the body like the breast skin. So if we're able to preserve the breast skin at surgery, that is going to give a far more natural appearance in the body form is what you're seeing below in a patient who has had um, an implant placed after a skin sparing mastectomy. We've been able just in the last um, probably 10 years, been able to really advance this a step further by saving the entire skin envelope, including the nipple areola complex and what we refer to as a nipple sparing mastectomy. There are a lot of different incision placements that can be performed for this. It can be in the inframammary fold, as you're um, seeing indicated here, um, as well as other locations coming out um, from the border of the areola. And that's really at the surgeon and plastic surgeon's discussion and discretion as far as what's going to be best. Unfortunately, not every patient is a candidate for nipple sparing mastectomy. The size of the breast, the ptosis of the breast, um, it can be sometimes limiting. 95% of the blood supply to the nipple and areola complex comes up through the breast tissue itself. And if there is too much distance to 
once that's been taken away for it to come out from the, per the peripheral perforators, the nuclear complex uh, won't survive. And that is a very critical part of decision making on who is best suited to have a nipple sparing mastectomy. And that in of itself includes um, another piece of that decision making for patients is the education from what a mastectomy really is, the multiple surgeries, as I was just mentioning, but also that's the give and take of um, mastectomy um, in a prophylactic setting. When we talked about we're reducing our risk, so hopefully we don't have to undergo cancer treatment with nodal surgery, potentially chemotherapy or whatever systemic therapy may be involved in the side effects that can go with that. The give on the mastectomy side is with that blood supply to the skin goes the nerve supply. And so from a surgical standpoint, we're also removing those nerves, making everything very numb. So there's no sensation as far as that fine sensation, two-point proprioception, arousal, those things are lost. And for women, that, that can be significant because the whole point of us doing all of this is to, is to keep women um, living. The last picture that you're seeing on the bottom right is another option that we have um, that is pretty fantastic whenever we can do a risk reducing mastectomy and that's when we can use autologous reconstruction. So in the spectrum of reconstruction, you're seeing from a nipple and skin sparing on those two middle pictures, those patients have an, have an implant placed versus the patient on the right had a, an autologous reconstruction with deep flap reconstruction where they've used the fat from the belly and used those perforator vessels to reconnect them into the vessels between the ribs to be able to keep that fat um, alive. And it is using the patient's own body tissue. So there's a huge spectrum. And that is the other advancement that we have made in the last, honestly, decade is we can now go direct to implants the same day as mastectomy instead of having to do tissue expanders and expand them weeks in the clinic and a second surgery. We can also do risk-reducing mastectomies the same day that we do the autologous reconstruction. And it has been um, quite impressive on the improved outcomes we've had for patients. The types of reconstruction is really the important conversation in that next education level once a patient has decided to move forward with risk reducing mastectomy that they will engage in with the plastic surgeon. Breast implants several years ago um, had a, um, an, an unfortunate bad name um, put on them and it's because of a type of lymphoma that's been identified. But fortunately, through additional studies, it was through a very specific type of implant with a textured implant, which would not be appropriate. And we certainly don't use in our practice and um, as well as the plastic surgeon societies um, have had official statements against using that type of implant. So with that, we still have a lot of great options, a lot of different safe, healthy um, implants that we can use. Um, we can do tissue expanders, which is like an inflatable and deflatable implant that can be put in the same day as the mastectomy. We can go direct to um, an implant and, and saving that, that surgery. Even the autologous reconstruction has changed a lot. As I mentioned um, just on the last slide, the deep flap reconstruction, but we are able to use also um, areas from the thighs. Um, so just because you may not have the, the right um, body habitus and for having a tummy tuck aspect of things, but you still want to use your own body tissue. There's other options out there that a, a, a um, especially a microvascular plastic surgeon can discuss. The important piece about reconstruction is that that was an area, a huge gap in risk reducing mastectomy for patients and, and an incredible psychosocial aspect of what goes along with having a mastectomy is losing that body form. And what reconstruction has allowed us to do is get that back for women. So they're able to maintain that feeling of wholeness and that feeling of feminism that um, has been shown to be associated with reconstruction. But it's not right for everybody. It's multiple surgeries. There can be phantom pain associated with it. It's surgery. And unfortunately, surgery modifies the body. And there can always be lasting effects, including different types of pains or even phantom pains, neuropathic pains that are associated with this. So it, we have to pick the right risk-reducing mastectomy for the right patient and the right type of reconstruction. All right, Dr. Cabelli, I'm going to bring it over to you to talk about ovarian cancer screening and then risk reduction. Well, thank you. Well, we, what we've heard is that we have all 
we've made so many advances with breast cancer screening and all the different types of imaging available. Unfortunately, uh, for ovarian cancer, we do not have any good screening method for ovarian cancer. And as was discussed earlier, the risk of developing ovarian cancer with women who have a BRCA2 pathogenic mutation is anywhere from 16 to 27% lifetime risk. Um, so our Society of Gynecologic Oncology, which is SGO, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so I'm stumbling on the, on the words of my own society, ACOG, recommend that for women with BRCA mutations that routine screening with a serum CA125, which is a tumor marker blood test or a transvaginal ultrasound is not recommended. Um, however, there are um, shared decision-making models for this where sometimes we will use these modalities in following women who are at risk. And it might be reasonable until the time of risk reducing removal of the tubes and ovaries called a risk reducing bilateral salpingoubrectomy, which I'll talk about in a moment. Despite uh, multiple um, studies looking at both CA125 and transvaginal ultrasound screening here in the United States and in Europe, there's no decrease in mortality or increase in survival when um, these modalities are used for ovarian cancer screening, even in these high-risk populations. Um, there may be an advantage of detecting cancers at earlier stages, but um, really the survival analysis did not show any benefit. In many cases, indeed, what happens is you identify tumors that are not cancer and you end up taking far too many women to surgery for non-cancer reasons and then often you miss cancers that you should have detected by the screening. So the screening is not effective, unfortunately. So many of us are working in the research space to try to find uh, different ways of trying to detect this disease early. So in the next slide, the options we have for preventing ovarian cancer and reducing or well, risk, risk reducing um, procedures for reducing the risk for both ovarian and breast cancer is removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes. And this is called a risk-reducing bilateral salpingoubrectomy or a BSO. And this is an image, um, which you can see is the blue uh, tag in this screen is identifying um, an underlying structure called the ureter. And right above it is the blood supply of the ovaries coming into the pelvis. And what we do is remove the blood supply and remove the ovaries at the pelvic brim to make sure that we've removed all ovarian tissue. Um, so general gynecologists can perform this procedure, but we, we, we try to educate the public and our colleagues in gynecology to make sure that you're removing the entire length of the blood supply to the ovaries and you are removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes at the base of the, at the, um, at the top of the uterus, which we call the fundus, so that we are not leaving any residual tissue behind. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the other important piece of this is that we have a very specific protocol for analyzing the tissue that we remove, which we send to the pathologist. It's called the CFIM protocol, sectioning and serially examining the fimbriated end. And here you have a picture of the fimbria, which is the finger-like, end of the fallopian tube. There's a cartoon of it and also um, histology under a microscope. And it's really important to analyze in these serial sections um, to make sure that you're not missing any precancer or cancer in, in, in uh, these high-risk populations who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 pathogenic mutations. And this is a critical point for um, our gynecology colleagues who may be performing these surgeries who remove women's ovaries and fallopian tubes all the time, but don't necessarily have that relationship with the pathologist to ensure that we're not missing an occult cancer. So if you go to the next slide, the reason the, the end of the fallopian tube is so important is we now recognize that the most common cause of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous ovarian cancer, 
Uh, and here is some histology on the left side of the different types of ovarian cancer. But the one that circles high-grade serous most likely arises from the fallopian tube. And um, what happens is we have these precursors or uh, 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 precancers that develop in this tube and then seed the surface of the ovary and then almost immediately spread all throughout the abdominal peritoneal cavity. And so if you think about um, the challenges we have with screening, well, if you have these microscopic precancers at the end of this tiny little finger-like ends or the fimbria of the fallopian tube, ultrasound is not likely to pick up those precancers or those really, really early cancers and will only likely pick up an abnormal structure on the ovary. And so, um, so really important that the main um, strategy we have for reducing the risk of ovarian cancer by more than 90%, 96% is by removing both fallopian tubes and ovaries. Now, if we go to the next slide, because of this theory that this type of ovarian cancer develops in the fallopian tube, we have implemented a, a strategy in the United States and in Canada and in Europe to perform opportunistic salpingectomy, removing the fallopian tubes as a strategy for preventing ovarian cancer in the general population. So if somebody is done with childbearing and uh, they're undergoing, and they decide that they want surgical tubal ligation to have their tubes tied, we would recommend just removing the tubes instead of having their tubes tied. Or if a woman is undergoing a hysterectomy for bleeding fibroids, but wants to keep her ovaries, we'd recommend removing the uterus, but also removing the fallopian tubes as well and retaining the ovaries. Um, what we know now is that many women, young women who have undergone these procedures, which are usually recommended um, for reducing the risk of ovarian cancer, removing the tubes and ovaries, we recommend it typically um, when women are done with childbearing for BRCA2, typically between the ages of 40 and 45, for BRCA1, typically between the ages of 35 and 40. Um, these are young women who are uh, essentially getting their ovaries, their main source of, of hormones removed from their bodies and undergoing menopause a decade before the natural um, age of menopause. And this causes major lifestyle um, uh, changes, um, changes with insomnia, hot flashes, sexual dysfunction. So in fact, there are a couple of international clinical trials looking to see if we can use this method of removing the fallopian tubes first and then coming back later in high-risk populations to remove their ovaries. I wanna emphasize that this is in the setting of clinical trials and that the standard of care is to remove both the ovaries and fallopian tubes uh, for high-risk populations. And then for women who are not at risk for ovarian cancer, if they're having surgery for another reason to remove their uterus or tubal ligation to remove the fallopian tubes only. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you. That was my question was about, did this apply to high-risk women or just average risk women? So even in average risk women, undergoing another procedure, they may consider opportunistic self-injection. Right. Awesome. So just to round out our patient's cancer screening that we're gonna be recommending, um, she does have a BRCA2 mutation and a family history of pancreatic cancer. So we would recommend considering pancreatic cancer screening, which at KU Cancer Center we do in a high-risk GI clinic and they alternate annual MRI or MRCP with EUS. And then we also recommend melanoma cancer screening um, with a full body skin exam and minimizing UV exposure. So sunscreen, avoiding direct sunlight. And so our patient elected to proceed with the screening breast MRI. She requested a consultation with the breast surgeon to discuss risk reducing mastectomy, as well as a consultation with a gynecologic oncologist to discuss a BSO with or without a hysterectomy. So Dr. Cavelli, would you recommend a hysterectomy to her? Well, um, the, the, the factor that's really most important is to remove her fallopian tubes and ovaries. So the BSO is what's gonna reduce her risk. And there are some reports that with BRCA1 mutations, there's a slight increased risk of developing a uterine 
cancer called uterine serous carcinoma. That risk really is not apparent with, in women who have BRCA2 mutations. Um, uh, you know, it, certainly if she has her ovaries taken out and her uterus taken out and um, she experiences severe um, hot flashes and has severe symptoms of menopause, she would be a great candidate for estrogen replacement. If she kept her uterus, however, we would have to give her both estrogen and progesterone to prevent endometrial cancer. So again, this is one of those situations where shared decision-making is really critical and, um, and whether um, she's somebody who would want to uh, be placed on um, hormonal replacement and those types of, you know, the options of hormonal replacement as well. All right, Katie, can we just um, approach cascade testing a little bit? What is cascade? cascade testing and how would you direct this patient? So cascade testing is the process of testing other family members due to a known mutation in the family. Uh, so given that we know that there is a BRCA2 germline mutation, uh, we would recommend that her brother consider doing this testing uh, due to there being similar or also male cancer risks. Um, men also can get breast cancer. Uh, it's now been recommended that men over the age of 50 uh, with significant breast tissue do you consider having mammogram screening, um, as well as we can see in the family history, the pancreas and the prostate cancer screening. Uh, for the patient's kids, uh, they are both minors, so 14 and 16 years of age. And we don't recommend doing testing in minors. I, there are, are multiple reasons for that, that we wouldn't be starting screening until at least 25 years of age. As well, there are other things to consider, such as insurance, life insurance, that we would want individuals to have uh, a little bit more information before having this sort of testing. Sorry about that. As well as the process of um, extended family members. So there's no cousins listed on here, um, but we would recommend that uh, the patient's uh, aunt have testing if she has kids, consider doing uh, testing for those individuals if the aunt is positive. Uh, it's dangerous to assume that someone is positive, even though this does look like she would have a BRCA2 mutation, uh, we would still need to do this testing to, to verify that information. And we do see a lot of um, barriers to testing in general. So I know a lot of people are concerned about, um, oh, insurance isn't going to pay for it, or I'm afraid of what it's going to do to um, my insurance. But as of right now, medical insurance in a, a person's job is protected from using genetic information against them in the GINA Act. But like you said, some of those other insurances life insurance, disability, long-term care, they are not protected. So those are things you would advise to kind of get in order first. Um, mm -hmm. We also see a lot of barriers to just knowledge and access. So access to genetic counselors. We're really lucky to have um, genetic counselors, but even um, having multiple genetic counselors, we know that that's not enough to serve our community. And a lot of people go to their primary care, OBGYN, to discuss cascade testing or genetic testing up front. Um, and so it's really important to kind of disperse this information and the importance of testing um, for individuals, especially if there's a mutation in the family. Insurance can I did, I, uh, be a, a big concern. As you mentioned, there are federal as well as state laws that protect health insurance, um, but there are loopholes in those laws. And um, one of them being that it has to be with companies that have more than 15 employees. So people that work for very small companies or maybe have their own self-insurance may not have those same protections. So it is important to talk to a, a genetic counselor or possibly even a lawyer if someone feels that they're in that situation where they need uh, to get that reassurance of if they are protected um, from health insurance discrimination. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna ask a few additional questions. Um, Katie, you brought up BRCA2 in males. So Dr. Wimblad, I'm going to bring that to you. What do we do for breast cancer screening in our male population? There was a, 
Yeah, there was a 12 year observational study published in radiology in 2019 that showed there might be a benefit to screening for some of our high risk male patients. And these would be our male patients that have had a prior history of breast cancer, those with Klinefelter syndrome, and also the BRCA2 patients. So we do recommend that uh, these male patients have a discussion regarding annual mammography um, to decide if it's right for them to do that additional uh, or to do screening mammograms every year. And those mammograms though, if, correct me if I'm wrong, do they get covered as screening mammograms by insurance or are they diagnostic still for them? So, you know, it, um, most insurance companies specify uh, screening mammography for females. Um, I, so most of them, we will still charge them typically as a screening mammogram. Um, uh, whether or not it is covered as a screening mammogram is typically up to the patient's insurance. So they can always check with their insurance carrier to see how that will be charged. Okay. And then um, I wanted to go back to the discussion of mastectomy. I've heard a little bit about, um, we talked about nipple preservation as possible. Um, is there any studies going on to try and preserve that nipple sensitivity? And, and what are your thoughts about that, Dr. Wagner? So um, I would say the area right now that it's being um, explored the most are patients who are undergoing autologous reconstruction, in particular, those with a deep flap reconstruction, um, just because that's, I think, the majority of autologous that is currently being done with trying to be um, reconnect some of those nerves. It's very early stages of that, but there are several institutions that are um, exploring that, that potential. I will also tell you though, um, very interestingly, um, the original study that was published by um, MD Anderson of their initial 54 um, nipple sparing mastectomies, and this has been well over a decade ago, um, was one of the first trials to actually look at nipple sensation. And so the two-point proprioception was not maintained in patients undergoing mastectomy, but the somatic function was. So nipples will still um, become erect with stimulation like cold or, or to touch, but that sensation from the patient or the arousal that was previously associated with it has been lost. Thank you, okay. And then I wanted to go back to the hormone replacement therapy to Dr. Cabelli. Um, so it, say that this woman, um, she undergoes a BSO um, and say she leaves her uterus. She decides not to proceed with the hysterectomy. And then she finds out that she's just miserable and having hot flashes and night sweats and she can't sleep. Is it okay for her to go on hormone replacement therapy? It is okay for her to go on hormonal replacement therapy. We talk about the risks and benefits and there is a small, um, very small increased risk of developing breast cancer with combined hormonal replacement. But that risk gets very small and at her age, it's probably very, very small. Um, and, um, and then if she had her uterus taken out, we would give her estrogen replacement therapy alone. And that has not been shown to have an increased risk for developing breast cancer. Perfect. That's exactly what we consult patients on too <laughs> in the highest breast clinic, but it, it's always, we get many patients that come to mm -hmm. us miserable mm -hmm. um, and they're afraid of hormones, but um, she's at a reasonable age, or I would usually say it's reasonable to consider hormone replacement therapy until a more natural age of menopause. Right. All right. Um, and then what if this patient was younger? What if she was 26 instead of 46? Um, we talked a little bit of, and she wasn't done having kids. Um, Katie, is there any guidance that you would recommend to her before she would consider childbearing? Or is there anything that she could explore? A lot of women, when they find out they have the mutation, there's a guilt that comes with it and they're afraid to have future children because they, they fear passing this down to their children? That's a, a really good question and a really uh, real fear that, that women do have and, and want to be able to prevent as much as they can. Uh, there are uh, technologies such as in vitro fertilization um, that can 
be a way to make sure that uh, if you do have a child and want to make sure they don't have that mutation with a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, to make sure that we are not um, having uh, an egg or an implanted egg uh, have the BRCA or whatever genetic mutation there is. Uh, it is a very expensive procedure, so something that I would definitely want them to uh, talk to a fertility clinic about um, to get a lot more information of is it something that is right for them and their family. Thank you. Dr. Nye, can I also mention if this is a younger woman who's, who is not quite um, ready to have children or is done, it's not uh, completely done with childbearing, um, there is a, a non-contraceptive use for oral contraceptive pills in this population. So um, if this patient was 26 years old, she would be a great candidate for the pill, which reduces the risk of ovarian cancer by approximately 60%. Um, and so that's something that I would probably counsel her about. And it does not significantly increase her risk of developing breast cancer. Right, thank you for question. bringing that up, yes. What about the IUD? Um, the IUD is now, uh, the progesterone IUD has been associated with a decreased risk of developing ovarian and uterine cancers, and that, that could be another option. And the good thing with the IUD, the progesterone IUD, not the copper IUD, the progesterone IUD can be left in for several years, three to five years, depending. And you don't have to re uh, remember to take a daily pill. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have a break coming up, so please take some time to engage with our exhibitors. If it weren't for our exhibitors supporting this conference, we wouldn't be here today talking to all of you. Um, so enjoy your break, and we'll see you back soon.